Good morning, and uh, thank you for coming so early in the morning. It's a bit uh, nippy outside there, uh, although for Boris it would be very warm and comfortable, Boris. And I really appreciate Boris Malgrin for coming to AIOS and also in this course, and we are looking forward for your main lecture, sir. Thank you. Uh, this say, a course uh, is primarily uh, trying to address uh, the need and uh, <clears throat> demand of uh, the patients, our dear patients, and, and refractive surgery has become a tool to achieve that goal to deliver the patient a good quality vision uh, with less or no uh, dependence on the glasses. So, Although refractive surgery is very important for us to keep, but keep in mind it is just one step towards reaching that uh, goal of giving and delivering quality of life with uh, less dependence on glasses and make them even happier. Our patients are already happy, but we want to make them happier. So with that uh, in background, uh, we have uh, sometimes uh, challenging situations and how to deal with this the conundrums uh, uh, addressing this refractive surgery component is the theme of the uh, morning today. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, we have a very good uh, faculty here. And we begin, we have five speakers, and then uh, we will have the, the highlight of the session of Dr. Malik and uh, Boris' uh, uh, lecture at the end of these five presentations. So stay tuned. And let's begin. Our first presentation is by Dr. Leda Sastri. So good morning, everyone. Cataract surgeons across the globe have agreed that when a patient undergoing cataract surgery has significant and regular corneal astigmatism, then the best way to treat it would be to advise a toric lens, and that is a, perhaps the most effective and predictable option that we have today to achieve amyotropia. Given that the incidence of treatable corneal astigmatism can be as high as 20 to 40 percent in our cataract population, the use of toric lenses have become more of a norm than an exception. And yet today we come across situations where we are not very sure whether suggesting a toric lens to this particular eye would be a right choice or not. So today I'm going to share with you some of such patient experiences that we have learned a lot from. The first patient I share with you was this middle-aged lady who came to us with a complaint of blurred vision in both her eyes and having undergone one eye cataract surgery elsewhere about a year ago. On refraction, we found that she had a significantly high astigmatic error left behind in that eye. However, it was this notch in the pupil that made me a little suspicious as to what was exactly going on. On dilatation, we found that there was a posterior capsule dehiscence. The lens was in the sulcus, but very importantly and surprisingly, it was a toric lens in a sulcus. So we have a decentered toric lens in the sulcus in the previously operated eye. This is the other eye that we were planning to operate, and what I'm showing you is the aberrometry image of that eye. In my presentation today, I will be sharing with you a lot of these aberrometry images taken on iTrace workstation because this tool perhaps is the only place, although by assumption I can actually demonstrate the performance of a lens inside the eye. So for those who are not very familiar, these are the corneal aberrations in the lower left corner and what this patient has is significant corneal astigmatism which is regular and treatable. Here what we have is the total eye aberrations, everything stemming from this eye. And what the machine does, what eye trace does, is it concludes that whatever that did not stem from the cornea must be coming from the internal part of the eye. And for all intents and purposes, the internal aberrations mainly stem from the lens. So because it's a cataractous lens, we have all these bizarre red and blue bars. With this patient having significant residual refractive error in one eye and a treatable corneal astigmatism in the other eye, the dilemma is what do we do? Do we suggest a monofocal lens? Should we ask her to you know, wear glasses for far and near in both her eyes? Or should we try and reach emetropia in the second eye with the hope that we can reduce her dependence on glass? We followed the second option. We advised a toric lens. Following that eye uneventful surgery and toric lens in the bag, 
I am now showing you a post-operative aberrometry image where we hope that the internal aberrations are actually coming from the lens, which is a toric lens. So as you can see here, this is the corneal astigmatism that is being compensated completely by the toric lens inside the eye. As a result, there is absolutely zero astigmatic error left behind. But when you actually see her visual performance, this kind of a visual performance would definitely lead to a happy patient and a binocular unaided vision that would be less dependent on glass. So actually the lesson learned is that even if the previously operated eye has a significant residual refractive error, we may want to treat as much error as possible in the second eye. If it has astigmatism, then treat it with a toric lens because that will significantly reduce the patient's dependence on glass. But a very important another lesson is that the toric lenses are meant to be implanted in the capsular bag in a well-centered manner. So if for any reason, if the capsular bag is compromised and we are not sure whether we can leave it behind in the bag exactly in the axis that it was meant to be, then it would be wiser to abort the plan for toric lens and implant a monofocal lens instead. A decentered toric lens will not only fail to do the job that it was supposed to do, but it would induce more astigmatism and other higher order aberrations that would significantly reduce the patient's quality of vision. So we always want to aim at leaving behind the toric lens well centered in the bag. The second patient is a farmer, a one-eyed person who came to us for his cataract in his left eye, but also had multiple corneal opacities. On slit lamp examination, we found that although he had almost nasal half worth of corneal opacities, the central cornea overlying the mesopic pupillary area was free from them. So we were quite hopeful that we should be able to give him a good visual outcome. On ocular parameter evaluation, we found he had a significantly high astigmatism to the tune of almost four diopters. But a very important thing here to ascertain would be the regularity. Given that he has a lot of corneal opacities, we want to make sure it is regular astigmatism. Fortunately for the patient, it was a completely regular corneal astigmatism, a typical bow tie in the central four millimeter area only. So we decided to go ahead and implant a toric, a T9 was implanted. And following that surgery, the patient was extremely happy with his unaided performance. So the more important lesson learned is that whenever we are associated corneal pathologies with cataract, we want to pay special attention to the cornea overlying the mesopic pupillary area because that is the cornea patient is actually going to use for his sight. And if that cornea is free from pathology and has regular treatable corneal astigmatism, then and only then we want to advise a toric lens which would definitely give rise to a beneficial outcome. Final patient for me would be the young female executive who came to us very, very unhappy. She complained of blurred vision in both her eyes and severe glare while driving at night. On asking, she told us that she underwent one eye cataract surgery a couple of years ago and had a multifocal lens implanted. Extremely unhappy following her cataract surgery. We on slit lamp found that she actually did have a full diffractive multifocal lens, but the patient was categorical that I absolutely do not want another multifocal lens in my second eye, which is why I have come to you. Given all of her complaints, we were expecting that on aberrometry we'll find a lot of aberrations. Maybe the lens is decentered. Maybe she has a very high angle kappa and alpha. To our complete surprise, there were absolutely no internal aberrations. The eye was completely suitable for a multifocal lens. She actually had significantly high corneal astigmatism to the tune of 2.25 diopters that was completely left behind uncorrected. So as you can see here again on aberrometry, this is the corneal astigmatism that was getting manifested into the total eye performance and this patient actually required minus two diopters of cylindrical correction to get a good crisp 66 vision. To again show you the same thing in a visually simulated format, this is the blur caused by the astigmatism of her cornea resulting in the total eye blur which made this patient so unhappy and she was not using any glasses whatsoever until now. When we evaluated the second eye that we were operating, we found that she had significant astigmatism in that eye also. And again, this eye also was suitable for a multifocal lens. But we had a dilemma. The patient was very clear that she absolutely did not want a lens that can possibly cause her any glare. She wanted to use computer throughout the day because of her kind of work. And although she accepted that she will have to use glasses while driving at night because of the glare problem, she was not exactly very keen on wearing glasses all day. With this kind of a profile, we suggested two options. We said we could either put a toric monofocal, but then you would need to use glasses while working on the computer. Or you could go ahead with a multifocal toric lens with a low ad power. 
Now this lens we explained to her would not only give her a good crisp vision for far and intermediate which would help her work on the computer but would additionally have a very remote chance of causing any glare. Following our confidence with it, she went ahead with that option of multifocal toric lens. Following this lens implantation, the patient extremely happy with her outcome in that eye. But let's take a look at the objective evaluation on eye trace again. Here is the corneal astigmatism, which is beautifully compensated by the toricity of the multifocal toric, giving the kind of visual outcome that we would want for all our patients. But again, very importantly, is the binocular unaided performance. And with this kind of an outcome, the patient is not only less dependent on glasses was extremely happy and she will selectively use glasses when necessary. So the lesson is that just because somebody has a multifocal lens and is complaining of glare, it doesn't have to mean that it is arising from the multifocality design itself only. Very often uncorrected corneal astigmatism will not only cause glare and blurred vision but it can cause starburst kind of glare which is extremely debilitating. So whenever we are suggesting a multifocal lens to a patient, we want to be very very careful in our astigmatism evaluation and make sure that we are correcting as much of it as is possible. Finally, I would conclude and say that if we find that the lens and eye would actually benefit from a toric lens and if we can ensure precision at every level of its execution right from evaluation to surgery, then this particular IOL technology, the toric lenses, can be extremely rewarding in those who are suitable for it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lajja. And I think uh, uh, I just reiterate what Lajja said. The toric IOL uh, correction is a necessity now, and uh, we talk about the ometropic defocus, spherical defocus, but we do not pay attention to astigmatic defocus. So even 0.5 diopter of uh, defocus astigmatism will be more lethal than a 0.5 spherical. So I think uh, it should be a standard practice. We need to justify why we are not putting toric IOL. So I think this is, this is very good, and thank you, Laja. I have a question. The, uh, the, before I learned all that, I used to have that if it is with the rule astigmatism, I, I correct differently. While it is against the rule, I correct differently. So could you clarify that, Shail? What is that with and against the rule uh, philosophy? Yes, I think uh, what we need to keep in mind when we are doing a toric IOL that we need to keep in mind the astigmatism that the patient is going to be left behind after the surgery. So it's not just the difference between the K1 and K2 that the patient starts off with. We need to add the factor of the surgically induced astigmatism as well as the posterior corneal astigmatism which not most of our machines would give us as a direct value. So typically with age, uh, the posterior cornea give, has an against the rule component uh, to it. So if a patient, if you are measuring with the rule astigmatism, that already existing posterior corneal astigmatism which is against the rule will reduce that with the rule astigmatism which means you are actually overestimating what you are measuring for with the rule astigmatism and vice versa for against the rule you are actually underestimating what you are already measuring. So uh, for many years uh, there were nomograms like the Baylor nomogram, like the Abu Lafia Koch nomograms where you used to add that correction factor of 0.3 based on whether it is with the rule or against the rule. I think fortunately thanks Thank to you. Dr. Graham Barrett, uh, most of the no, no, problems no, 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 no. of toric IOL calculations have been taken care of uh, and his formula algorithm itself takes into account the posterior corneal astigmatism. So for now people like me who get very confused with, with the rule, against the rule, vertical, horizontal, we don't need to be very conscious about that. The calculators take care of most of it. Thank you. Thank you. Move, move, we move on now to the rather difficult situation and uh, Shambhrish is going to address that. And thank you, Dr. Ramavarti. Uh, Mike. Okay. All right. Again, a uh, very good morning. Uh, I'm going to be discussing how to address post-refractive surgery eyes when it comes to uh, cataract surgery when they land up in your clinic with a cataract. And there are many issues when you are uh, looking at these eyes. Practically speaking, one of the biggest issues is planning because most of these patients don't have the data, don't remember, have you know forgotten uh, about whatever numbers they had. Some of these surgeries are also complicating in terms of the surgery planning in, as in RKs or patients who've had any sort of incisional surgery because there are issues with the weak corneas and the incisions gaping up. 
and of course there are post operative issues because at any point in time despite your best methods and best techniques they can land up with either biometric surprises and or surface symptoms so it's important to address all this when you're looking at these patients starting off with pre operative planning uh, or planning what i will put we have to understand that any surgery that has been done and particularly so with the older generation lasix you have altered the cornea to a significant shape and therefore you have added a lot of aberrations in that eye and so iol selection becomes very very important uh, and uh, choosing the right iol power is the paramount uh, question here there are many post operative issues that we are going to address as we go by in this so if you look at a cross section of an eye the eye has positive spherical aberrations which means the peripheral rays of light in a normal eye bend more than the central rays of light and that's a normal aspheric cornea with a positive spherical aberration and that's like peripheral rays which are bending and the central rays which are bending a little less if you do a myopic correction you are going to flatten the cornea in the center so the cornea which was somewhere like this after a lasik becomes a little more flatter depending on how much you have treated so now you're going to increase the positive spherical aberrations because you've treated the central cornea so the peripheral rays of light in comparison to the central rays of light will bend a little more causing more positive spherical aberrations so if you have to decide a choice of a lens in very basic these patients are going to have glare if you have a small zone lasik done uh, some time back so you want to because the cornea has more positive spherical aberrations you want to choose a monofocal iol with more negative uh, asphericity so that you can sort of compensate it inside the eye hyperopic lasik works the other way around you ablate the mid peripheral cornea so the cornea gets bumped up and the central cornea tends to bulge out uh, causing you that myopic shift increasing negative spherical aberrations in the eye which is exact opposite of a uh, myopic lasik and so you need a zero aberration lens because that lens will add minimum to the uh, already compromised quality of the cornea so if if you the rule of thumb for a hyperopic lasik choose a zero spherical aberration lens or an aberration neutral iol because it will at least not worsen their vision it's very important to measure the true corneal curvature and uh, why is it difficult because simple things like keratometry and topography corneal topography are based on only the anterior surface and there's a lot of assumption involved in measuring the cornea and a lot of assumption involved when you're actually calculating the iol power for these eyes why all this happens is because the uh, the topographies and the manual keratometries read the anterior surface of the cornea in a normal cornea the anterior surface and the posterior surface would follow a particular path together but because you've done a lasik in the central cornea the anterior curvature is flattened the posterior cornea is still steep because you've not treated it so the the formulas that were the older generation formulas assume that if your k's are say 39 and 40 the posterior cornea follows and the anterior chamber follows the same pattern but because you altered the eye with the surgery the anterior cornea is flat but the rest of the eye is equally round at the bottom so all the formulas don't work well how do you measure true corneal curvature there are many uh, newer devices like the shineflog imaging and now with the octs that are doing topographies you can measure the anterior cornea and the posterior cornea and this is unlike a placido because placido is only measuring the anterior corneal curvature biometry is extremely crucial and it, i think it at least for these eyes it's very important to use optical biometries either in form of an optical or a swept source biometry because you measure the visual axis of the patient and the visual axis is most important so i think these are the eyes where uh, at least contact should not be done if it's avoidable and preferable to move on to an optical biometry because a good biometry and a good anterior chamber depth will understand and help us in understanding the effective lens position and like we discussed if this is a normal cornea and a normal eye which we have operated this is the acd but if you flatten the anterior cornea the older generation formulas which do do not incorporate the anterior chamber depth in their calculation will assume that the cornea the lens is going to sit lower and it's going to wrongly calculate the biometry of the patient's eye uh newer formulas take into account uh, the anterior chamber depth and i think that's the rule of the thumb so just to show you if you calculate with an srkt formula in a patient who's undergone uh, lasik some time back and you would put a 17.5 diopters because the because the k readings are lesser we are like 33 and 34 so one assumes the anterior chamber is also appropriately uh, smaller and the whole eye follows but if you follow a newer formula the actual eye will required for this eye with the holiday 2 formula is actually 21.5 and that is why we land up with surprises most of the time is because first measurements are not proper and secondly we are using formulas that don't incorporate the true anterior chamber depth and formulas based on assumption are not a good idea for post refractive there are two good options available to all of us uh, one one of the best options available to all of us has been the ascrs online calculator 
So we decided to find out what works well in our practice and what we should actually follow and what we follow at Raghudeep, we just decided to figure it out. This is the ASCRS calculator which gives us options. This is free for all and it gives us options of myopia, hyperopia and RK. And so depending on what surgery is being done, you can use the formulas, feed in the data uh, and you can get a few formulas to work on. You can get uh, so many formulas which are available on the right side giving you what would be the approximate IOL power based on each formula and whichever formula you fancy you can follow that formula. Another newer formula that are available again for free for all of us is the Barrett True K formula. Uh, Barrett True K is incorporated in the ASCRS formula as well, but the Barrett True K is also available for free as a separate formula. And so we decided to compare and see which formula works for which eye. Uh, and we looked at the IOL prediction error for, the, for all the formulas. We found out that there was a least prediction error, error with the Barrett True K in a myopic LASIK, which is statistically significant. And uh, compared to the other formulas and we concluded that all formula do, do well in post LASIK eyes. The maximum, the best eyes were with the true K formulas, uh, with the Barrett true K formula. We also looked at what happens in prior RK because a lot of RK also walks down to our clinic now because so many RKs were done a few years back. And again we found out that there's a formula called Atlas 1 that does the best uh, IOL prediction followed by Barrett true K again. Although it was not statistically significant, but it did well for us in the clinic. And again, uh, refractive prediction was very good with Atlas 1 and a Barrett True K formula. And most of the eyes were within 0.5 to 1 diopters. So we concluded that although all the formulas that have been worked do around uh, well, more, and, uh, more or less good, Barrett True K in our hands works very well for myopic eyes, uh, for uh, post myopic uh, LASIK eyes, and for RKs, Atlas 1 and Barrett True K both do good. And I think that's the take home message. If you have a patient who comes to your clinic, just use the Barrett True K formula uh, or the ASRS online calculator. And please don't rely on older formulas, if at all, for a post uh, refractive surgery eye. But there are a few rules of thumbs to understand. Please look out for cornea irregularity. And a patient who has an irregular cornea, decentered ablation, one wants to avoid all sorts of IOLs that have advanced technology. So far as to go ahead to say, don't even put an aspheric IOL because aspherecity is an optical property which may add to the blur if you have a poor cornea to start with. And also measuring a pupil size is very important because patients who have extraordinary large mesopic pupils will have high aberration profiles. And this is just to show an, uh, an approximation, uh, again from the eye trace aberometer. If you notice, this is a pupil of 1, 2 millimeters, which is the patient's daylight pupil, and the vision is this. And as you go down to a nighttime vision, you realize how in a post-refractive surgery eye, everything opens up. And uh, patients with larger pupils need to be counseled for, uh, for the fact that no matter what you do and no matter what surgery you do, you're going to land up with glare and halos, and that's because of the optical properties of the patient's eye. I'm just going to briefly run you through one or two cases to show you that this is a patient who's been operated for LASIK. Uh, has a grade 3 sclerosis and a straightforward 1.2 diopters of astigmatism. And like uh, Dr. Laja brought about, it's important to understand the pupil size and I've learned from so many seniors that now by now we have to understand that pupil is not just there as an anatomical body, it's a refractive element in the eye and the pupil aids to refraction. A larger pupil causes a myopic shift, a smaller pupil causes uh, emetropia or a better distance quality vision. And in this case, the pupil, a mesopic pupil or a dim light pupil shows a regular astigmatism. So all that around the eye which will deter you from putting an IOL is not important because right in the center of the pupil which is the path where the light will fall is a regular astigmatism. And so we decided to calculate using the ACRS online calculator at that point in time and put a toric IOL in this patient and the patient runs up with an uncorrected vision of 6 by 9 doing very well. So just to highlight that you can put a toric IOL with the right formula so long as you understand that the patient's aberration profile or the astigmatism in the pupillary area is regular. Only and only if it's regular, it can be done. Another important issue to address and understand is the problem of dry eyes, which these patients will have. And it's very important to understand that because one of the potential concerns, apart from the fact that there is unreliable biometry, is also the fact that you have very, very wrong K readings that you can pick up. So we had this patient in the clinic and look at the aberration profile of the topography. And after four days of putting them on a good lubricant eye drop, the entire aberration profile vanished, which was not because of the LASIK, but it was probably because of the dry eye. All this also translates into IOL power calculations. And so it's a good idea to do a good tear substitution for these patients before you plan them up for surgery. Wait it up, let the tear film stabilize, and then go ahead. 
So in, in, in just to conclude, it's very important to choose the right IOL for these patients, but it's paramount importance to look at the eye as a whole and not just jump to the surgery. Assess the cornea, assess the corneal dryness, address that first. Use the right IOL calculation formulas with the right K readings. And then if the patient's corneas are good, you can go ahead and implant IOLs like toric IOLs and aspheric IOLs because they will give very, very good visual outcomes in these patients. Thank you. Thank you, Samresh. <clears throat> I think uh, you made it very clear about this pericity and aspericity lens and which one where. Just to repeat, uh, if you have a hypermetropic uh, correction already done by LASIK, you want to put zero, but in reality, not all people use zero lenses. So you can avoid a spherical lens, which is getting very popular, generally speaking, avoid that and put a spherical lens or a zero power. And uh, the pupil size, try to estimate meso mesopic pupil size and then determine. But Dr. Ramamurthy, you have been doing this for uh, so many years and you taught us so for a long time. You have a comment on what uh, Samresh is saying. I think uh, I almost entirely agree with what he said, and uh, my go-to formula is Barrett True K, irrespective of whether I have uh, preoperative data or not, both in RK as well as classic patients. And I think it's extremely important to ensure that these patients have a fairly uh, well-centered cone, if at all we are using toric and tropical lenses. I have one doubt, Samresh, I mean, you mentioned about this Atlas formula. I have not used it. I mean, can you just elaborate on this? How is it? Better so, than Barrett Rookie? Yeah, so uh, uh, the Atlas basically uses the data from the Placido based Zeiss topographer at 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 millimeters of the pupil, the keratometry, the average K. And what we found is that particularly in those which have extremely irregular RK cuts, the keratometry varies so much at different corneal points. So uh, that formula takes into account the keratometry at up to 0 from 0 to 4 and averages it out. So we found in the post RKIs when we, we actually didn't use it as a first line but when we reviewed our data we, find, we found that if we would have used Atlas we would have been slightly better uh, compared to the true K. Yes. Come here on the mic please. that the atlas one is not a separate formula you have to acquire or uh, get in a machine when you go to the ascrs online calculator which is completely free of charge it has a uh, series of formulae of which when you choose the post rk option atlas is also one option so i think you can go with those values in short i think one confusion you need to clarify is that this uh, acrs calculator gives you number of different values depending upon the formula so which one to choose so uh, I think, yeah, the, the uh, average, I mean, so far the trend was that the ACRS gives you so many formulas, it gives you the minimum, maximum and the average and most uh, of us uh, in the early on period used to use the value near the average. Now I think most of us have a particular formula that we prefer to and like Dr. Ramamurthy correctly suggested, we go closest to the Barrett's formula. So for example, if the Barrett says 20.2, we would choose a 20.5 diopter uh, or something like that. Okay, thank you. So stick to one formula. You will learn more yes. and improve on it. Uh, I do, uh, can I have my presentation? Please? I do receive research grant support from Alcon, uh, so keep in mind. But I'm going to share my views on uh, uh, this uh, customization of this biopic solution in real, real life situation. I'm going to address with IOL uh, only at the moment. But we do recognize the other options we have like monovision strategies, the traditional multifocal, the trifocals, the low add multifocal, and so on. And I'm going to address that uh, two main options, the traditional multifocal like Technis, Atlisa, Restore plus three, and then in evolution came the low edge, which improved the distance vision and intermediate, like Symphony, Restore 2.5, Oculentis, and so on. And now, uh, in last the recent time, the trifocals, uh, the Atlisa, the Physiol, Panoptics, and few others. But the key is that we need to have this customization 
uh, on a scientific basis primarily, but also take into account uh, the patient's profile, his, his, his hobby, his profession, his psychology, personality, and so on. So understand the eye profile, uh, and you will learn more about it uh, in uh, uh, presentations to come. So I'm going to take one, two, or three cases, and this is an 80 years old lady, which otherwise mentally quite okay, with some memory issues, as we would expect, uh, and wants to watch television and read. But her problem was that she had a bilateral cataract, and she was wearing reading glasses for that purpose, not using the distance because she was not a very outdoor uh, person. And uh, she would forget where the glasses were. And when she came for the cataract, we found that she was a good candidate on our investigations, that she is a suitable candidate for multifocal. This is the time when we were having a traditional multifocal and low ads uh, uh, multifocal lenses. So we decided to use the uh, traditional multifocal, but warned her that you will need additional light uh, or s little extra light because the, these multifocal uh, reduce the contrast sensitivity while reading and so the, and she said, that's okay, uh, my, my children will take care of that. So we decided to put plus three, uh, but you could have gone for technies or any other, that, that's, that's quite all right. And uh, then we realized that she was very happy because she didn't have to remember and she could, she could read very well. And we, this helped because the traditional multifocal has an advantage, that they have a really a good quality reading vision. They may have many other problems, some intermediate visions or halos and glare, but the positive part of it is that, that they have a decent reading vision and therefore it suited uh, this old lady, uh, but make sure that the eye is suitable uh, for it and age is not an issue with that. Second case has a younger person and those who are uh, not familiar, we all have many, many younger patients coming up now in recent years with cataract, God knows why, but this is one of the typical case, an engineer, bilateral cataracts, and wearing minus 1.5 uh, already, before the cataract, and even with now. And this family had young cataracts. Now, uh, on examination we found she, he has a PSC cataract, and aberrometry, as you, as, you, as you saw in the earlier presentation, had no angle alpha uh, value more than four, uh, and uh, we thought it was suitable uh, because of the ocular surface and all other checkup, it, it was suitable for the multifocal. Now, the problem is that young men, they want to see everywhere, they want to do everything. No, but no more glasses, sir, please. And uh, they are driving the cars, motorcycles, and uh, they want to do computer, they want to do everything. So we had to have a binocular strategy, and at that time uh, we had this, which we found very useful, with uh, one eye, which is a dominant eye, which will have a distance vision and also intermediate vision, because we found and we realized that 80% of our population, be it in the USA or in, in this part of the world, use distance and intermediate vision more of the, their 80% of the time of their wake up time. So we thought this would be the right thing for dominant eye putting low add uh, multifocal giving a very good quality distance vision and sufficient intermediate vision at, at about 50 uh, or 60 centimeters. So we decided to do that and then uh, after two to four weeks time we put a traditional multifocal in non-dominant eye giving a reading vision. And uh, we discussed that preoperatively, that uh, when you use both eyes, you will be fine, but never do that, never compare each eye, never look into the light, because many patients come uh, after the surgery that I see, when I look at this light, I see halos. But did you look at this light earlier before the surgery? Never. So why you want to look at and test yourself for these little things which could be there? So we, we, we counsel them not to compare, not to look into the light, and, and please uh, be patient and uh, wait a month after the second eye is done, and you would still need uh, selectively for some activities, 
use of glasses, so be prepared. So we did that blending with uh, uh, that, and, and uh, with that additional reading from the traditional, uh, we had a full range from uh, near 30 centimeter, 35 centimeter to distance. So I think uh, that that strategy can be useful for this uh, kind of problems that the patients may have, and younger ones uh, are, are, and particularly males, are quite uh, uh, not easy because uh, the ladies are very kind. They will be happy as long as they can do their makeups. So males are more demanding. So you can consider that strategy. And, and as, a, as expected, their unaided performance was quite good, 6-6, uh, six, six because of the uh, restore 2.5 in one eye. Intermediate was good because of the same low ad, 50, 60 centimeters, typical distance. And near uh, the traditional multifocal help. So, uh, that's okay, and they, they needed uh, one eye, 1.25 eye with the eye with the low head whenever they had a demanding near vision. So uh, it's, it's, it's practically a, a good thing, and the uh, only thing, uh, other thing is that because this guy was wearing minus 1.25 or 5, uh, and the myopic, the distance for, for the near would be different. So teach them beforehand they don't expect it to read the distance you were ha handling before your distance will change. So if you prepare them well, uh, they, they are okay as this patient was, and he had no glare. Uh, although I was expecting, even with one eye traditional, many patients do have. But if you prepare them well, the neurosensory adaption, uh, adaption is really is this magic. So be aware of the young people, male patients are difficult to please. Myops need to be told about the, uh, the new reading distance that they would need to uh, get used to it. Uh, this case uh, is a, another youngish person, physician, bilateral cataracts, has a fairly active medical practice and he is already using progressive glasses uh, for last uh, 12, 15 years. He likes to read which I'm surprised because most of the doctors are so tired they don't read these days, certainly not the journals. Uh, but he goes on the weekends in the clubs and uh, plays cars, and he always drives uh, in the city. Uh, and uh, if you're driving in Delhi or Gurgaon, you don't have to worry because you, you don't have a speed. So glare is never an issue. You're too close to the other car. But if you're driving in a, in a good city where there's less traffic, that can be an issue. Uh, uh, so, and he said, you know, if you can, I would love to have uh, no glasses here. And uh, we learned from our experience of the traditional multifocals and that we need to go through the drill of the ocular profile. We need to have sufficient counseling and use of good light when you read because he was a reader and be prepared for occasional hallows, but, but you then still will be able to handle it if you, if you are uh, prepared to accept this. And we decided to go for binocular uh, panoptics, which is a, a relatively later addition on the trifocal lenses. In general, trifocal lenses are very good because they try to address uh, all the three distances. Uh, some lenses have a distance at about 70 to 80, and the panoptics has about 60. So depending upon the activity, uh, you can do that. If you are in a kitchen or, or, or a chef or something, you need a long hand and long distance, you would go for a trifocal which has a 70 to 80 like at Lisa or, or uh, uh, Physiol. But most of the p persons uh, in this part of the world with not very long hands and mobile and computers would go for a 60 centimeter which pan optics uh, addresses very well. But whatever that is, uh, you can address that and we could do that with pan optics when this patient and he did uh, mention that he, he does notice hellos at night, but it's not a bothersome, and I, I'm, I'm ready to accept it. And he, he managed it quite well in a few weeks' time in the post-operative period. So uh, I think uh, uh, there is a compromise. We must not give an impression to the patients that you will get everything. You have to pay the price if you really want to uh, depend less on the glasses and still have a good quality of vision. That good quality will depend on his profession, his demand, and his fastidiousness or otherwise. But, but if you are motivated to accept that, 
this is very good and it will improve your lifestyle and really will, will produce that uh, happy, uh, happy patience for us and customization. But it needs a lot of chair time and counseling is the key word these days for anything, but including if you really want to achieve a refractive uh, target uh, to your satisfaction. So uh, it's a pleasure to invite Dr. Ramamurthy, uh, who is, uh, I think, uh, number one in the uh, experience on multifocal lenses. Uh, I went, and before the array or whatever, I don't even remember, I was a kid when he started putting multifocal lenses. So tell us how you deal with those unhappy patients. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Abai. It, uh, truly grateful to the first family in cataract surgery for repeatedly in, uh, including me in your wonderful symposium. It's, I deem it an honor. So my premise is to deal with uh, unhappy post-operative patients. These are my financial disclosures, and uh, some of the products I'll be discussing are manufactured by these two companies. Uh, I think the most important uh, aspect is to uh, pre-operative counseling. Whenever a patient comes to me for a premium intraocular lens, whether it's multifocal or torix, the points we want to drive home is that we are not promising total spectacle independence, but relative independence from glasses. And dysphotopsia is a price they pay. You buy vision for all distances using the currency of contrast. Usually recommend bilateral surgery because once the new occipital cortex is getting similar impulses, it seems to adapt much better. And a secondary touch-up procedure may be needed. An adequate time has to be given for neural adaptation. So once you have spent this time explaining this to the, your patients preoperatively, most, most often it's easier to deal with them postoperatively, not that they don't come up with problems. And when they come up with problems, these are the five Cs. The last C, crazy patient, is what I thought was most common. But now I realize that once you are perioperatively, pre-intraoperatively and post-operatively, dealing with all the other five Cs, your incidence of dissatisfaction does come down significantly. It was in our inability to understand the problems that the patient is presenting with that used to make us label many of us patients as difficult patients, crazy patients who are complaining, who are difficult to satisfy. So as far as uh, if you are talking about uh, premium intraocular lenses, it's extremely important to hit the target right. There have been speakers have elucidated how you can achieve that. But just in case you are unable to do it, there are several different options. Limber relaxing incision was something I used to do for quite some time. But almost 10 years back, I gave it up simply because I thought these are inaccurate. The results uh, do subside with time. But now with the availability of digital overlays, I once again have started doing this. It is not refractive accuracy, but what you are able to do is to debulk the amount of anterior corneal astigmatism that these patients have, and especially when you are combining this with multifocal intraocular lenses, it does help. And in case the patient presents with a problem, with a residual refractive error, we often uh, offer a LASIK or a transepithelial PRK, free of cost, and this is something which is explained to the patient even prior to the first surgery. You can see those intraocular lenses shining over there. Once you have addressed the re residual refractive error, it's not just the ne need for glasses that goes away, but we also find that the problems at dysphotopsy also subsides quite significantly. So it's extremely, it's usually three months subsequent to the initial surgery. Once the refractive error has stable, stabilized, wound is quite stable, we go ahead and do this procedure. And just in case we are faced with a large residual error, especially if it's a um, you know, hyperopic error, which is not amenable to a treatment on the cornea, then it's a piggyback lens which comes into our rescue. And it's a large 14 millimeter overall diameter, 6.5 millimeter optic lens, which is gently slid into the sulcus. You can see there is already a yak capsulotomy that is there. And this lens, uh, once you place this, you are uh, able to achieve good refractive outcomes. And now toric versions, multifocal uh, versions of this is also available from Indian companies, which makes it quite affordable. And they also seem to work quite well. And in case you have had a large refractive surprise and you feel that it's basically an error in the 
uh, power of the intraocular lens that has been calculated. That can happen sometimes when you are doing these surgeries in post-refractive surgery scenario. I just wanted to cut short the video. Then IOL exchange is what we do where we cut the lens by a quarter and then explant the lens and implant the lens of the right power. And if it's a hydrophobic acrylic, the faster you do it, the better. And in case you have a toric intraocular lens that's been implanted and there is a suboptimal outcome, then all you need to do is to go in with the irrigation cannula and gently nudge the lens into the right place. If the residual refractive error, the spherical equivalent is almost zero, that is if you have a minus one with plus two diopters of astigmatism, this is the situation where repositioning of these toric intraocular lenses is going to help. There's no viscoelastic that's uh, used. It's a two minute procedure and you are very often able to optimize the kind of results that these patients have. Needless to say, if you have an opaque uh, capsule, you need to open that up. But more importantly, in, when you have a multifocal intraocular lens, this is uh, um, bilateral implantation, two eyes of the same patient, you can see the diaphanous thickening that is happening there. And the quality of vision will significantly deteriorate even with this. Having waited for about three to four months, if the patient has complaints and you think dysphotopsia is not the problem, lens exchange may not be necessary, then I would go ahead and yak this, create about a three millimeter opening right in the center. Decentered lenses is something that's not uh, understood very often, but is extremely important. Again, bilateral implantation. You can see here the lens is extremely well centered by the diffractive uh, rings, and here is decentered. It may be because there's not a good capsular axis overlap, or it can be also because of a large angle alpha. I think subsequently this will be dealt with, and that's the reason. Anywhere when the angle alpha is more than 0 0.7, I desist from implanting these multifocal intraoc lenses. You can, in case it's a suboptimal implantation of the intraocular lens, you can do a surgical recentration. Laser hydroplasty has been talked about. Does work. I've just done in a couple of patients. Too much pigment dispersal, too much pain for the patient. So this is something that I would not recommend. But it's uh, uh, obviously prevention is the best cure. This is again a problem that we sometimes face. Everything has gone perfectly. You can see a toric intraocular lens done by one of my colleagues in my own center, excellent surgeon, a lawyer by profession, this patient, and had very difficult negative dysphotopsia. And uh, in these cases, bringing the optic out of the capsular bag is one of the options that's offered. But in this case, because the toric intraocular lens and the refractive error was uh, the absolutely emetropia, I did not want to disturb the lens. So in these cases, again, putting in a sulcus uh, lens, you can see this uh, sulcoflex lens that's going in is a good idea. Because it has a rounded optics, it has a large 6.5 millimeter optic, it seems to work quite well. Again, I just fast forward it a little, and that's the intraocular lens being, it is a zero power lens, purely implanted for dealing with the negative dysphotopsia. And you find that I've done it in three cases so far, and all these patients on post-operative day one, they uh, report immediate recovery. And uh, of course, uh, this comes at an expense, but it is something that's worth doing in case the patient is significantly troubled by this. This is what you see uh, in the slit lamp and in the uh, anterior segment OCT. You can see the double implant that is over there. And then, of course, dry eye. I'm going to quickly pass over this because this is something all of us know. I think the most important thing I want to recommend is when you are talking about dryness, it's most often the dryness that you have, you have induced because of your medication. So I think post-operative medication, I strongly believe less is more. And today, it's most often lubricants that's the most important aspect of my uh, uh, medication. Just two weeks of uh, uh, steroids, then subsequently just twice a day, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, drugs, and I find that the incidence of these problems is less. And of course, if you have a patient with a, a suboptimal ocular surface, I would deal with this preoperatively before going ahead with the surgery. And then, in case you have a... Uh, uh, doing an OCT has become a norm, not just for premium intraocular lenses, but all cases who present for cataract surgery in our center. The incidence of epiretinal membrane is almost 7% uh, in patients above 60 years of age. And these are the common problems that an anterior segment surgeon could easily miss. And obviously, if the patient has these diseases, then you have to avoid a uh, multifocal or even a toric intraocular lens. But sometimes if you notice them uh, post-operatively, they have to be dealt with in an appropriate manner. The patients sometimes complain of a uh, uh, dysphotopsia, but they are com completely happy with vision all, all distances. I have this simple minus two diopter uh, glasses with me. 
I tell the patients that if you are very much disturbed, I'll uh, take your lenses out and put a monofocal lens. But this is what you will lose. We put on these glasses and this will be your reading. This gentleman has been reading his newspapers in the morning quite comfortably, but complaining of a little glare and halos. But then once he realizes the price he has to pay and what exactly this multifocal is benefiting him, he immediately says that I would rather live with the glare and halos. So experience is what counts, and it's extremely important that uh, you uh, explain to your patients as to the, what is the small price they are paying for what they are experiencing. Very quickly, I'd like you to take through some screenshots of our practical patients. This case one, uh, LRCS with Symphony multifocal intraocular lens was done. And what I found was the, what the patient needed was a plus one diopter for a reading. It was extremely happy with distance and intermediate. So what exactly we did was two weeks later, we went ahead and implanted a Technis plus four diopter lens. And because of the bilateral implantation, this is a mix and match scenario, the patient was extremely happy with the outcome. Uh, look at this uh, case again, a uh, 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 symphony intraocular lens that has been implanted. But here the patient needed a plus 0.5 diopters for reading. Again, complaining, but quite happy with his distance and near. So what we do here is to just pump up the plus power that I'm implanting in the second eye. Can I take a couple of more minutes to show some? Okay. So uh, this is basically the concept of mini monovision where if the patient is requiring 21 diopters, we are implanting 21.5 or 22 diopters. And because of this bilaterally implanted, these patients seem to be quite comfortable as far as uh, all distances concerned. And this is something that we are doing all the time. Look at another scenario. You have a significant astigmatism in this patient. And what we implanted at Toric Symphony. Symphony is something I was using quite often. And uh, what we found that was the patient was again quite happy, but needed a plus one diopter uh, uh, as far as near vision was concerned. So the second eye, where basically he did a T6, and what we implanted now is a panoptics T6 in this second eye. And because he achieved emetropia for all distances with the eye which received a trifocal lens, the patient bilaterally implanted was quite happy. I find that now with the availability of trifocals, the conversation about mix and match, about uh, um, mini monovision has gone away, and most often you are able to satisfy your patients for all distances. And then again, you have a scenario like this. This is to emphasize the importance of dealing with toricity. You have a astigmatism against the, uh, against the rule in this patient, and uh, uh, you, what we implanted in this patient was a plain panoptics, the patient was quite happy as far as the near was concerned, but you see that there's a significant amount of astigmatism that's left over, and the uncorrected visual acuity was 618. The patient was complaining quite significantly. So what we went ahead, the second eye, the, the left eye, the right eye, had almost a similar degree of astigmatism, and in this case, we went ahead and in, uh, implanted a toric trifocal lens, and subsequently what this patient enjoyed was an absolute emetropia for all distances in the eye receiving toric trifocal, and we did a laser touch-up for the first time. So suffice it to say that nowadays we have made it a habit to uh, subject all these patients into a toric calculator, and in case they need anything beyond a T3, then always suggest a toric uh, multifocal intraocular lens rather than a um, uh, simple tri uh, trifocals or a multifocal intraocular lens. You have also got to understand that against the rule astigmatism and with the rule astigmatism are completely two different animals. You can see that this patient with a uh, against the rule astigmatism of this magnitude requires a T4 lens trifocal, but almost a similar dimension of uh, um, uh, toricity. What you find is uh, because it's with the rule, the patient does not require a, 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 a toric intraocular lens. So that's the, re, that's the importance of feeding in all your data into this. In, just in case you are not doing torics, but in spite of it, if, in case you are thinking about just putting in some uh, limbal relaxing incisions or arcuate incisions with a laser machine, you can see with just a 0.51 diopter of cylinder, you require a 22 degree arc. And this is something that's very easily done. You can see this uh, uh, almost at the first step. What I do is to go open, up, open up these arcuates. You can see a trifocal shining over there. And this arcuates definitely helps to debug the amount of astigmatism that these patients have to deal with. On the other hand, you can see a situation like this where it is essentially with the rule astigmatism where there are no arcs that are indicated. This is a readout from the very on, and it is important that you use all this. 
neural adaptation is something which is extremely important. It's most, well, both the problem as well as the solution. If the physician and the patient exercises enough caution, then most often it helps to uh, come to our rescue. And the last slide of mine, I think uh, I've been using it. Uh, the image might have changed, but the message has not changed. Because in my 30 years of practice of ophthalmology, from my ICC days to today, what I've understood most importantly is not the kind of lenses that you use, not, not the kind of machines that you use, that the empathy you have for your patients. When a patient comes to you with a complaint, it's more often an observation. If you do not counter that, you do not get into an argument with him, but tell him or her that I have understood your problem, I am able to fix it, then most often they go back satisfied. Patients are not bothered about how much you know, but they are bothered about how much you care. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Ramamurthy, for very exhaustive examples and making us understand how to make the patients happy. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Lajja, who is our preoperative expert and consultant, I have a question for you, Lajja. Uh, there are patients in counseling, uh, and you counsel them all, but what's your take uh, on some patients who look very cooperative, and how do you help? Handle that. I think it's very important that we spend some time talking to the patient, not just the content, but understand what this person is like. And it's not very difficult to do. If we spend like 10 to 15 minutes talking to them about their everyday life, what do they need to do, it's very easy to sometimes understand how picky, how type A, or how unforgiving this person can be. I very often come across situations where I have explained all the pros and cons of multifocality. The patient has completely agreed and accepted it. And yet at the end of the entire discussion, I have told the patients that I don't think you are suitable for a multifocal lens. And that's why we will refuse to put one in you. So I think understanding the patient and also understanding who to actually opt out from, that's a very important thing for a multifocal eye practice. I think that that's true. The experience will teach us. but. Even if the optical profile and everything fits into, just be careful, judge the patient himself or herself, uh, as she says. We move on to can the... I, can I make yeah, an observation, please, please, if you have the time? Yeah. I mean, I think we should not entirely go by the profile of the patient alone because, you know, I have uh, burnt my fingers quite often. If you have a high-end uh, uh, textile tycoon or a politician or something, even if they uh, go ahead and implant a multifocal intraocular lens, they might be having a problem. They never want to admit that they made a mistake. So they are not going to talk very much about it. They just live with it. But an old lady, innocuous old lady, she has a problem. She has some irritation in the eye. She'll go around telling the whole colony that uh, my eyes got spoiled because of this doctor. And it can be extremely damaging. So I'm actually more careful of some of these uh, uh, so-called innocuous patients who sometimes can be extremely difficult to handle. Thank you. I think we move on to the last presenta presentation before we, we, we invite uh, Professor Malugin. Uh, uh, no, hold on, apart from this. Very good morning. Uh, I think now with uh, just when we move around the trade, we see so many new gadgets, so many new instruments, and all the companies tell us that this is the instrument that you need to upgrade your practice, and this is the instrument that's going to change the way you are going to get perfect post-operative outcomes uh, after every cataract surgery. So are uh, all of these diagnostics actually necessary? Are they actually the future, or is this more just industry-driven that something new has to come up someday or the other? Uh, we do receive research grant support from Alcon Laboratories. So out of the several gadgets uh, that, uh, that are available, I'll be discussing some where we found, found some of these instruments very useful. Uh, this was a lady, 45-year-old lady, uh, who came uh, with complaints of severe irritation, watering, photophobia, myopes since a young age, uh, intolerant to contact lenses now, and wants clear lens extraction. Uh, so we had asked her on the phone that just remove your contact lenses five days prior, at least five to seven days prior to before coming to us. And we thought we'll, we should be able to help her significantly in doing a cataract surgery. Uh, what we did find was that with, when we looked at her eyes, she was constantly blinking all the time and watering all the time, even while trying to capture a single image on any of the instruments. So that itself gives us a sign that this patient is having severe ocular surface symptoms. So even if uh, by some or the other means you do manage to get a reading, 
that reading is unlikely to be very reliable. And that's what we found on the corneal aberration profile also. Uh, not only astigmatism, but lots and lots of corneal aberrations coming from the ocular surface. And therefore, we decided to stop uh, evaluating further. We talked to her about ocular surface. We decided to treat her before re-evaluating her. So I think dry eye assessment is something that is neglected and overlooked uh, in a busy clinical practice. And now we also have uh, objective evaluation of dry eye available. Until now, um, sometimes even when patients complain and we tell them we have dry eyes, they often tend not to believe us now. They want some evidence of what, what the disease that they are having. This is a tool that uh, we've been using recently, which we find quite useful. It's a dry eye diagnostic tool. Uh, and it not only does it give you about the tear film meniscus, the tear blink rate, it tells you uh, about the mebomian gland function, it tells you about the tear film breakup time, which is now more objective compared to uh, the ones that you do fl with, with fluorescein staining. And it will also tell you about the mebomian glands, uh, the orifices, whether, they are, whether they, are, they are enough or whether they are sufficient to cause uh, uh, symptoms. So I think some of these newer dry eye diagnostic devices are something that are going to be very useful for us in evaluating uh, or at least uh, rejecting patients uh, uh, for surgery treat them beforehand or at least know them, let them know the disease that they are having and the problems that they can have because of that. And there are several uh, other uh, uh, forms of diagnosing these dry eye uh, 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 diseases like MMP9 markers, uh, which may be suggestive of an inflammatory cause of dry eye. And I think uh, in, in the times to come sooner or later, this probably will become a part and parcel of routine practice, particularly for premium IOLs. As has been discussed, I think uh, getting good readings is e extremely important and I think swept source OCT in that sense is, uh, is definitely the way to move forward to when we are upgrading our biometers and it's mainly because of the accuracy of the readings that we are getting. So not only are we getting good and more reliable action length more consistently in all patients, but we are also now getting new, better keratometry readings with most of these machines measuring more points from the cornea than the previous generation ocular uh, biometers. Uh, and there is sufficient literature to support that the use of swept source OCT uh, may be the reason for improved performance in the post-operative refractive outcomes in some of these patients. Uh, and I think uh, this is something that we did in our own uh, in-house patients where we have access to both the lens star as well as the swept source stomy. And what we did find was that in about 85% of eyes, we could capture the uh, actual length in, with the lens star. So a significant 15 to 16% of patients had to be subjected to immersion. And not all of them are mature white cataracts. Many of them are posterior polars, posterior subcapsular cataracts. So uh, compared that to the swept source OCT, we could achieve a good actual length reading in about 98% of eyes, reducing the need for doing cumbersome immersion techniques which are more technician dependent uh, compared to the, uh, the automated biometers that are there. Uh, coming to another case, uh, another diagnostic instrument that uh, helped us, uh, uh, you know, learn significantly. Uh, a 55 year old male operated for a multifocal IL uh, elsewhere and very good pseudophakia, looks uh, very good, no complications during the surgery, a very round pupil. Uh, and he comes with a complaint of disabling glare that he's facing along with dysphotopsia and he's extremely unhappy about that. And several ophthalmologists have seen him before he has come to us for probably the 10th or 12th opinion. Uh, and everyone has said everything is fine, everything is normal and he's still very frustrated about the problem that he has. So when we evaluated this patient, we did find uh, that there were significant aberrations that were coming from inside the eye. Notice the corneal aberrations are pristine, but there are significant aberrations coming from inside the eye. Now from inside the eye, it could be anywhere from the corneal endothelium to the macula. Uh, but we were quite sure, having a clinical look at the patient, that the endothelium and the macula are not the ones causing the aberration. So it is therefore the intraocular lens which is giving these aberrations. And what we did find was that the center of the IOL uh, was quite different from the center of the pupil. And you can imagine now that most of these lights are going to be hitting the rings of the IOL 
causing a lot of scattering and a lot of stray, stray light as has been described. So uh, this is the quality of vision that the patient has and what we did find was that the patient had an extremely high angle alpha. So what is angle alpha and how it helps us in deciding patients is that this is, this is actually the photo slit of that patient, extremely well centered multifocal, I mean extremely well centered in the capsular bag, but when the pupil comes down, this IOL appears very decentered and that's because of angle increased angle alpha. So the role that angle alpha plays is that we have basically three axes, the center of the limbus, the center of the pupil and the visual axis. Now, however much we may try and center an IOL intraoperatively, once the eye is closed, the IOL is going to center into the center of the capsular bag. There is no way we can actually measure the center of the capsular bag and therefore it is assumed to be the center of the limbus, uh, so as to say. So the angle alpha is nothing but the angle between the center of the limbus and the visual axis. So if you can imagine, uh, when there is a higher angle alpha, what will happen is that the IOL will sit very nicely centered into the center of the limbus, but the rays of light are going to be significantly passing through uh, the rings of the IOL, which are going to cause symptoms, glare, negative, dis positive dysphotopsia, and causes of uh, post-operative unhappy patients. So uh, these are the cases where you want to be very careful in selecting these patients preoperatively for multifocal IOLs. And any angle alpha more than 0.5 or 6 is something that is a definite red flag. Be very careful about selecting these patients. So another role of an advanced diagnostic technique which helped us prevent uh, an unhappy patient post-operatively. I think like mobile phones have changed uh, life uh, all around the globe for ophthalmology, if there's one investigation that has really changed everything, I would say it's the retinal posterior segment OCT because there are so many patients even seen by more, the most experienced retinal surgeons labeled as normal funduses which turn out to have some or the other subtle macular pathologies which are actually causing post-operative visual disturbances. Look at this fundus photograph, very difficult to say if anything is wrong with this fundus photograph and when we, do, when we do an OCT we find a fine epiretinal membrane and these are the patients who are going to crib about the quality of vision that they see. They may be able to read the Snellens 66 or 69 but they, they are always going to be bitter about the kind of vision that they are going to see post-operatively. Uh, so we did a, a, a study, I think uh, uh, macular pathology is the most common cause, uh, subtle macular pathology for uh, uh, post-operative difficulty. And we did a study to look at all our pre-operative cataract patients and see all of them were uh, seen by an experienced qualified retinal surgeon uh, and labeled as normal uh, retina in all of them, all of those cases. So what we did find was that in the so-called normal looking maculas, 41 eyes, that is about almost 18 and a half percent had some or the other subtle macular pathologies, either uh, subfoveal drusens or PEDs or vitreomacular tractions, so on and so forth. So what we found was that ERM was the most common, followed by irregularities, foveal attenuation, vitreomacular traction, and rarely parafoveal telangiectasia. So this is another similar example showing the same uh, with a vitreomacular traction detected postoperatively and a lamellar macular hole. And this is something we published uh, recently in the American Journal of Ophthalmology uh, uh, showing how in a normal looking fundus you can pick up pathologies which you can preempt, therefore not treating these patients uh, with advanced technology IOLs. Uh, so I think newer diagnostics, uh, not all of them are fad, not all of them are just industry driven uh, or as a marketing tool. Uh, quite a few do have a lot of, uh, they add a lot of value uh, in preventing and reducing the number of difficult patients that you have to spend more chair time after surgery. Uh, and like Dr. Ramamurthy suggested, more lesser patients spreading the word that they had an extremely bad outcome at so-and-so surgeon post-operatively. So they do definitely help to raise the bar uh, and improve the predictability and at least give us the confidence that you know this is not the patient to do X, Y, or Z. 
So I'd like to end here and thank you so much for the thank opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Samresh, you have any comments on this value of the diagnostic equipment? I think uh, one practical thing is there is nothing better than good clinical evaluation, especially when it comes to dry eye. So good slit lamp evaluation and even the use of older techniques like looking at tear film breakup time or even an uh, no slit lamp is good. But if you're investing in a newer diagnostic like a topography, this is something that you have to look out for when you're looking at new machines. New machines have add-ons onto them and when you're buying a topography, you can buy a dry eye module with them or maybe negotiate it with them. But don't buy just one thing because th these days all topographies have mebographies attached to them. They have uh, non-invasive tear film breakup time, tear height. So look out for those things when you buy new diagnostics because then you spend less money and then you get the best out of the machine. Thank you. It's, it's a real pleasure to uh, invite uh, Professor Boris Malugin from Russia, Moscow, uh, to give this very important keynote address of the whole morning session. So, Boris, thank you once again for coming here and sharing your yeah. knowledge. Thank you very much, Abai. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to be here with you today and share some of our latest research on the role of anterior vitreous detachment uh, for cataract surgery complications. So we, we do uh, remember the lens capsule anatomy and we know that the thinnest portion of, uh, of the capsule is, uh, the, is in the posterior segment and it's uh, four microns. Uh, we also know the, uh, that the anatomy of the posterior uh, surface of the uh, lens uh, and its um, interrelation to the anterior surface of the uh, vitreous body is quite complex. Uh, there are several channels like a PT canal and there is a vigor ligament that is attaching the uh, vitreous to the uh, posterior capsule and is shown here by s uh, scanning electronic microscopy so that there is a quite firm attachment in between the posterior capsule and the anterior hyaline membrane and also zonules are uh, involved in, in that attachment. And we know that uh, from John Wurst that the uh, um, anatomy of the vitreous body is also quite complex uh, um, in spite of this uh, um, uh, transparency of, of this tissue. Uh, the vitreal lenticular interface is having uh, several characteristics. It's very transparent. Uh, it's uh, having a low number of uh, cells, uh, completely avascular. Um, uh, it has a distant consistency forming the anterior hyaloid uh, membrane and uh, it has uh, peculiar uh, biomechanical uh, properties. So this is uh, 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 de 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 definitely a very interesting anatomical structure and first it was described uh, um, uh, related to the posterior uh, curvilinear capsule rexis that was first introduced into the clinical practice by the Belgian ophthalmologist Albert Galland. And then uh, more recently uh, there was uh, uh, an interest in, in that structure uh, that was also um, generated by Belgian excellent surgeon Marie-Josée Tassignon. She was uh, studying the uh, relationship uh, of the posterior capsule and anterior vitreous in congenital cataracts. Um, and uh, it was shown that, uh, uh, that the, there is a, uh, a complex relationship and there is a dysgenesis dis of the Berger space uh, in patients uh, uh, having um, uh, congenital cataracts, which was later on proved by uh, uh, immunohistochemical chem chemical, uh, evaluation uh, studying the, again, the interrelationship of, of, of these structures. Uh, actually, in, in our clinical practice, we were being able to, uh, to study the anatomy of this structure by uh, intraoperative OCT, uh, which is, um, uh, we, we do have several systems uh, now available uh, for, um, uh, for the surgeons and I'm using one of them uh, showed here. So intraoperative OCT uh, does not give you the opportunity to study the, uh, the interrelationship between posterior capsule and the anterior vitreous before the surgery. Uh, however, during the, uh, the, uh, the course of the procedure, 
you can actually see uh, uh, when the lens is implanted and you see the lens is implanted into the capsular bag and this is a very typical uh, appearance of the posterior capsule uh, which is having um, a wavy shape and also in some patients we can actually visualize not only the posterior capsule uh, but also the uh, burger space uh, which is uh, uh, the um, uh, space in between the posterior capsule of the lens and anterior um, uh, hyaluronic membrane. Uh, we were quite interested in that space because in some of the patients we've seen uh, the particles that are located uh, behind the posterior capsule and they, they were actually uh, located uh, behind the lens and we were not sure w w where is these particles are. Um, 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 uh, located. So we were trying to use intraoperative OCT in order to find out uh, the, the exact location of these, um, uh, of these um, uh, fragments and as shown here sometimes we were being able to identify them um, uh, on, on the OCT as a uh, hyperreflective dots uh, located uh, somewhere uh, uh, behind the uh, posterior capsule and again you see these uh, uh, dots uh, here. So this is um, another uh, representation of these uh, particles. You see this, uh, uh, um, uh, these dots that are located uh, behind the posterior capsule um, and uh, in, in the anterior portions of, of the vitreous. So this is what we actually can see uh, postoperatively. Uh, we also can identify uh, these uh, um, uh, mini fragments of, of the lens. Uh, however, this uh, exact location is not really uh, uh, obvious in, in this case. So we studied um, a number of patients um, uh, uh, preoperatively and intraoperatively and postoperatively. And, and this is the uh, uh, summary of results. And we've seen that um, in 71% uh, of patients, we actually b were being able to identify the burger space. And, uh, um, and we, we've seen in some of these cases uh, hyperreflective uh, membranes, uh, hyperreflective dots in, mm -hmm. uh, located uh, behind the uh, posterior capsule. Uh, however, it was not always being possible to identify uh, uh, that um, in postoperative OCT, as shown here by the difference chart. So let's have a look what's, uh, what's going on during the cataract surgery. So we see that the, uh, uh, the, there is a posterior, uh, uh, the, uh, the detachment fro of the posterior capsule from the anterior um, vitreous uh, uh, hyaloid membrane and there are several predisposing factors to that <coughs> that may be age related, comorbidity related and also surgically related uh, by uh, fluid passing through the zonules. So this is uh, uh, a kind of mechanism that happens so we, uh, the fluid goes through the zonules, goes behind the uh, posterior capsule and leave the capsule um, above uh, the uh, regular plane. Uh, this is how that happens um, uh, uh, during uh, the surgery. And, and again, uh, when we are fragmenting the lens, the lens are going, uh, these lens particles are going uh, through the zonules and accumulates in, in the area um, um, in front of the anterior hyaloid membrane. Again, you see these um, uh, particles here and as shown uh, on that uh, video uh, fragment. However, as I mentioned to you, it still w was not absolutely clear where these uh, particles were located. So we tried to prove the concept by injecting triamcinolone acetonide through transzonular injection is now being done and excessive um, uh, uh, substance uh, was removed from the uh, and washed out from the anterior um, uh, um, uh, chamber and then we, we observed these hyperreflective dots uh, in this area in between the posterior capsule and the anterior hyaloid membrane proving that this is exact location 
uh, of, of these particles in that Berger space. So what's happening uh, with, this, um, uh, with this condition? So when, uh, when the fluid goes uh, behind the posterior capsule, it becomes flat and then uh, it's easy uh, to be aspirated by the uh, irrigation aspiration handpiece or it can uh, be in the contact with the uh, ultrasonic, uh, um, uh, ultrasonic vibrating needle uh, making that uh, uh, complication uh, to happen. So this is uh, uh, how that happens and this is how uh, PC rupture occurs uh, uh, during uh, the course of cataract surgery. Again, we see inflation of the Berger space, flattening of the capsule from the oblate to having a prolate uh, um, uh, shape and then aspirating uh, the, uh, uh, the capsule. This is a clinical example. We see uh, this is the patient um, uh, with, uh, with the uh, with the posterior capsule, which is not oblate, it is a rather prolate uh, and uh, locating a, in, um, uh, in the plane of, of the iris. That makes the aspiration uh, much more, uh, 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 chance of aspiration much higher. So this is how that happened uh, during that surgery, uh, during cortical cleanup, uh, the capsule was aspirated and of course we need to avoid anterior uh, prolapse of the vitreous and we can actually see this uh, hole in the posterior capsule and sometimes even vitreous herniation can be observed on, on anterior uh, seg segment OCT because vitreous goes out and uh, prolapses through that, uh, through that uh, uh, hole. Uh, by injecting viscoelastic, it's possible to reposition the vitreous, uh, make the posterior capsule axis, and as shown here, uh, reposition the, uh, the anterior hyaloid, and then implant the IOL, and again, you see the IOL is located in the capsular bag um, uh, in, in, in that case. So this is just another uh, clinical example of, uh, of the um, uh, vitreous uh, and the posterior capsule damage during the, uh, during the last steps of the fake emulsification procedure. And the reason for that, again, is the um, a fluid that goes uh, behind the posterior capsule, lifting the capsule and placing the capsule in contact with the vibrating uh, ultrasound um, uh, um, needle, as shown here. This was the contact in between the, uh, the, the needle and the, and the posterior capsule. And uh, definitely we need to convert that into the posterior curvilinear capsule axis um, and uh, to be able to evacuate the cortical material and implant the, uh, the IOL into the capsular bag. So to conclude, um, we do think that uh, intraoperative for CT verification of uh, uh, crystalline lens particles uh, or medical suspension uh, in, in the space between the posterior capsule and the anterior hyaloid membranes confirms the inconsistency of attachment of the vigorous ligament in approximately 70% of cases. And this defect of vigorous ligament could be a source of capsular complications due to excessive hydration uh, of the uh, retrolenticular space. And we published uh, this uh, uh, in uh, uh, this year in uh, uh, first number of GSCRS. Uh, this is our article on, on, on the results of that study. And we uh, even uh, come up with the classification of, the, uh, uh, of that uh, syndrome starting from uh, first grade we, when we cannot see any uh, uh, lifting of the posterior capsule and uh, going to the third grade when the, the prolapse is uh, more or less significant. And I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Boris, so very much for enlightening us for relatively a new subject or new area of interest which has a tremendous impact 
uh, on the patient's health when we perform any surgery, particularly cataract surgery and so on. So thank you so very much. I think, uh, thank you, and I just want to say finally that uh, the refractive, cataract refractive surgery is become, uh, has become a norm and it's patients expect that. So keep all the options open for the patients, counsel them well, assess them well, and, and then patients will be very happy and you will be uh, also very happy. So thank you so very much for your patience and uh, patient hearing. Thank you.